How's everybody doing? Merry Christmas to everybody. My name is Brian Cameron with Camelot Home Inspections. Um, and we're going to talk about foundations. We're going to talk about roof coverings, foundations, and foam insulation. Um, what we'll start out with is going to be foundations. And I'm just basically going to talk about how I do my foundations and things that I find, how, how do you consider a foundation to be bad? And really that's not our job to consider a foundation bad. We see things that don't look right and then we should be uh, telling our clients that they should get a, a foundation company, structural engineer, whatever, you, whatever term you use to go out to the house. So basically what I'm gonna talk about is going to be um, how to try to figure out if there's a foundation problem or, or not on a home. The best thing to do, if you think there is, then you should probably put down, you know, that they should get a foundation company to come out and take a look at the foundation. Things that I look for when I'm going around, you can see this first picture right here is, uh, they got a low grade right here. Let me move my picture. And you can even see a little bit of water that's there. I don't know. Can you see my cursor? I don't know if you can. If somebody can just say something or not say something, but type. You got your downspouts coming down right here. It should be, you know, away from the foundation area to where water don't go back up against the foundation. And those are things that I look for. Another thing I go around the house and I'm finding cracks in the wall. For instance, the first picture right here shows a crack that's been sealed up that tells me that there has been movement going on to what degree I don't know. Um, anytime I see cracks or in the second picture, you see the uh, crack in the foundation wall. I take everything and I do it like a story. Like, is there anything going on in the inside of the house? Can I see the foundation on the inside of the house? Are there cracks going on on the inside of the house? If I see one crack, that doesn't mean there's a foundation problem. Um, that just means probably settlement in most cases. Uh, there have been issues where incidents, incidents where there's been a crack and yeah, it was foundation problem, but in most cases, if you have just a normal crack, it doesn't necessarily throw up red flags that there's a foundation problem. There's usually two or three other things going on with that. The first picture shows cracks that's been uh, basically repaired that tells me that there might've been a foundation problem at one time, maybe they got it fixed. The other picture shows me that there is movement going on there and that's a lot of movement. You can see right here, you can see where the mortar was and then you can see where it moved. And anytime I see that, I'll probably go inside the house and see what's going on on the other side of that wall. I've even seen it where I went up inside the attic and I would actually see the roof rafters pulling apart. Again, foundation cracks going around the house. Um, a lot of times if you have high soil, that's gonna basically keep you from seeing the foundation. I don't go around digging up the foundation all the way around the house. I may take a shovel in, in a couple of places that I think I might see a crack, but I'm not gonna go around the whole house and make the foundation to where I can see it. Um, this picture right here, First one is, that's what I would call just a settlement crack. Doesn't really, that doesn't really bother me as long as there's not a lot of other stuff going along with that. Just keep in mind, the house needs to tell you what's going on with it. It doesn't actually talk to you, we all know that. But all these little bitty things in one area should be able to tell you something about the house. The next picture is a corner pop. Uh, basically they're caused from the brick just thermal expansion is pushing down on that corner and it'll pop it off like that. On this one, I probably would have told them, you know, it needs to be repaired, but I would let my client know that that's not uh, a big no on, you know, not buying the house or, or whatever, because it isn't a foundation problem. Um, a lot of people would see something like that and just think the house is going to fall down. I let them know that this is on just about every house that's around. Uh, sometimes there'll be cracks. On the side, I'll put it in the found in, in the report, but I don't make a big deal out of it. I don't make a big deal out of these. But I let the client know because if the client walks around, doesn't read the whole report, 
and they see that, they're going to think I missed something unless they go back to the report. So I try to point these things out to my clients. Freeze boards. Freeze boards are big time tattletales for me anyway. Um, this area up here is the soffit. And this is the little board that's underneath the soffit. People have different terms in different areas. I'm in East Texas is where I'm located. Um, I call it a freeze board. Basically, there's separation here and they filled it back up. So more than likely, this house has had foundation problems. All these pictures are pictures out of my files. Um, and I think on this house, they did have foundation work going on at the time. Not at the time, but there had been foundation work going on. I still put it in my report. And a matter of fact, I notate, even if I know there is foundation work, just from me looking at it, no one's told me, but I can tell. I don't put in my report that there's been foundation work. I put in there, it's possible that there could have been foundation work. And I recommend asking for the documentation. And if they don't have the documentation, I recommend a foundation company coming out. I tend to go fast. Um, if somebody needs to slow me down, I guess you can text whatever you need to do. I see something up here. Let me see what this is. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks, guys. I appreciate that. I didn't know what that was going on. Um, this is another foundation. If you're walking through a house and you see this, you, you know there's something going on. But at the same time, I'm still not going to tell the, tell the client that you, at, you, you have a foundation problem. I would bet my kid's life on it. What I'm going to do is put inside the report and explain to them that they really need a foundation company to come out and take a look at this and let them further evaluate what's going on here. Me and you may know without a doubt that that's foundation problem, but for me and my report writing, um, I let them know that it, it, it does need to be looked at, but I'm not going to put inside of my report that it is a foundation problem. Um, let me make sure I'm in the right place. Yeah. Okay. This little square right here. Does anybody know what that is? Now that I know where to look for my chats at, does anybody know what the square is? Just, just say it. Okay. This little square that you see right here is normally where a pier has been poured to support the house. Yes, John, thank y'all guys, I appreciate it. Um, and when you have this, I notate, not necessarily that there's been foundation work done, even though me and you know this, we know this without a doubt, I'm still not gonna put it in there. And the reason why is because you can have a client, I mean, a seller not know the house had a foundation and they can just come unglued and then you have to go back out to the house and explain to them what's going on. You don't have to, but it's the right thing to do. So in order to get rid of all that, I put down that um, there is movement and it looks like there has been some foundation movement inside the house. Uh, there are these little squares that resemble uh, where they would put piers for a foundation problem. Um, and, and you see where I'm going. You can read what I got right there on the side. And basically that's, what, that's one of my narratives for this. Walls on the inside of the house, this first picture, you see that straight line right there. Ignore the other one, pretend like it's not there. I couldn't find one with the straight line in my pictures, but those don't bother me too much. I mean, if they're all over the house, yes. Again, any crack in the house could be a foundation problem, but there should be something going along with it and tell you the story of it. The other two lines, what bothers me is these lines are diagonal or, or where the, the drywall's pulling apart actually pulling apart, not just where there's tape and bed and, and it's pulled apart a little bit. And then you've got that, um, that little straight line that goes down between the two pieces of sheetrock. That, that doesn't matter to me. So it's a diagonal lines that really I pay attention to. And another kick or two is looking inside of closets. Um, a lot of times people that are flipping a house, they won't take care of inside the closet cracks, they may just paint over them. If I see a crack that's been sealed up, I'll just say that it looks like there was a crack there. You know, I, I put in my report what I'm actually seeing. Um, 
and you, you're going to have houses that are older houses that are going to have cracks like this that has nothing to do with the, pay, with, the, with the foundation at all. You just have to figure out, you know, which ones that is and not as you go through the house and you're looking at everything, let everything come to you and you kind of figure it out. And then you'll know whether or not, yeah, I need to, you should call a foundation company, come out here and look at this or not. Maybe there's cracks that should be monitored and it's not causing any problems right now, but we don't know what's going to do in the future. The little tears and corners where the two walls come together and it looks like it shifts like that or like that, and it's got tears in it. Um, that, that's the foundation. Um, that throws out to me that there is something going on there and I'll look around and see if I can find anything else. The other picture that you see is just another diagonal crack more of the tears. Here's a real tattletale sign. Anytime you have a house that has linoleum or something like that, you can, you need to really look at it throughout the house, especially if you're seeing cracks on the outside, you should go inside and really look at the floor. If you have carpet, it, it's harder to see. You're not going to see it as well. If you don't have carpet and you have linoleum, you can, uh, you can almost see the cracks going through the linoleum as it's going across the living room or wherever it's going. And if you'll follow that crack to the exterior of the house and you go out there and you uh, basically look at the foundation, if you can reach the foundation and see the foundation, uh, basically you can, you, can, you can almost follow that crack where it's going. Um, even though it looks like it may be going straight, sometimes a crack could take off and go that way. You just need to, you, you kind of have to look around and you're not looking around to determine if it has a foundation problem or not. To tell you the truth, this floor right here with the crack going through it underneath the, the uh, linoleum, that's good enough to put down that, Hey, there's foundation movement going on here. And, uh, and it needs to be looked at, but I like to know for myself, the more things you look at like this as an inspector, and I don't know how many new inspectors we have in here or how many veteran inspectors we have, but the more things that you look at and try to search it out, the more knowledge you're going to have on each inspection that you do. It's going to just make you smarter and smarter and smarter. Here in Beam Foundations, um, basically, just rotten wood, moisture, rotten wood, fungus growing on the, uh, the, the subfloor. Hey, Greg. Good. Uh, the fungus growing on the subfloor. Uh, basically, that's, that's from moisture. If you go underneath the house and there's a dark colored powdery um, on, underneath the, uh, the subfloor, I, I don't call anything mold, okay, guys? That's not in my vocabulary. It's not in my re reports vocabulary. But it's either um, discoloration from moisture or, or something like that. But anytime I find that, um, I put it in the report and let them know that they have some kind of fungus growing underneath the house. And it's most likely from water, if you want to put that in there, uh, or from moisture is a better word. What happens is, is, is moisture will get on the ground and that ground water moisture will evaporate. And when it evaporates, the wood sucks it in. When the wood sucks it in over years and years, what, it, what it's going to do is it's going to cause wood rot. I don't know any veteran um, inspectors in here, but if you go underneath the house, you've seen it to where it's caving in, the wood's caving in. That's usually for moisture, um, too much moisture underneath the house, and that's why it's caving in like that, unless it's termites. But I'm talking about when it's moisture. Over here, this first picture in that corner, um, this is actually, I can tell you a few places, whenever you drive up to a house, you got the valleys coming in the front, and then you got a porch with the cover on it. Where those valleys come, when you have a pier and beam home, and you have things that are falling down, water that's falling down onto the ground, and it's bouncing back up, and it's going into that crawl space area. That's a lot of water throughout the years. This one right here, I remember, I could stick my finger right in there. The wood over here is good and the wood over here is good, 
but some way or another, the way that that water was coming off the roof and hitting the ground and then bouncing back up into, uh, there might've been a, a vent on the other side of this. Anyway, water was bouncing back up in there and it was going to this area. Again, I don't explain all that inside of my report. I basically put in there um, that there is some rotten wood and we recommend a pier and beam uh, company to come out and take a look at it. Over here to the right, um, you see the piers right here. You can't see, I didn't get the picture that good, but those two boards that you see right there, they're going straight up to the floor joist. You, you can't have that, especially when the house is using beams all the way around. There are some very few houses I've run into that they use the floor joist to support. It's almost like little boxes everywhere. And then they've got the piers coming up and the piers are supporting that. But anytime you have a beam that just goes up to a floor joist, I'm sorry, a pier that goes up to a floor joist like that, basically what's going on is, is when that house is settling where the piers are, these right here are gonna leave humps in most cases. Um, and you don't want that. Right here, you got wood to ground contact. You don't want wood to ground contact underneath the house. Any electrical wires that are underneath the house, and I would tell anybody, if you see a bunch of electrical wires and it's wet underneath that house, don't go under it. Do not go under it. You'll end up getting electrocuted if there's been rats or something like that chewing on them wires and you got a positive negative down in there um, or, or ground and you touch that, you, you could end up getting shocked and that's not, that's not a good day. This area right here was at, at an area that I was telling you earlier where the water is coming off the valleys and it was hitting. No one knew about it. This is at the very front of the house. It's kind of hard to get to. And the wood was just decayed away. Uh, they even had some foundation work done to this house. I remember it. And you see that board underneath. That's a newer board than everything else. And I don't really know what they were doing there. I have no idea. But it went into the report. Again, this is that fungus that I was telling you about. This is the water stain. Your main place is to look underneath the house. It, you're not gonna be able to look at every inch of everything that's going on. But what you can look at, if you can get to it, are laundry rooms, bathrooms, kitchens. The places I'm telling you where there's valleys coming down, the water's hitting down. If you have a front door that doesn't have a cover over it, underneath inside the crawl space underneath that threshold of that door front door or back door you're probably going to find wood right there those are places that you can go and you can look and you'll know um, if you're just getting started out it's best if you go and inside of a crawl space and just take extra time in there and look at things um, you'll be surprised what you find when when you take your time and you really go through it and you look good at everything that's on there in, inside the crawl space area Again, this is a pier that has a crack. The first one, I would put that in there. You can see the board above it, that's a beam and it's leaning on it. If that does end up cracking completely, somebody's walking inside the house and it can cause that to come loose. That board right there is gonna have a bouncy area inside the house. It may not cave in or anything, but it's gonna have a bouncy area inside the house. And over time, it will cause problems. The next picture that we have um, up here at the top, where are these center blocks right here? And then you come down, I can tell that somebody's done repairs there. That doesn't really bother me. Somebody sealed that up. But anytime I have a, a foundation, pier and beam foundation wall like this, and they've got cracks through the center blocks. Uh, and plus I see down here that there's been water down here. That's a water line that's going on. Then you got some efflorescence going on right here. There's a water problem underneath this house and more than likely it's gotten wet and one side or the other has, has shifted on it or sunk down or, or, or something. And that's what's caused that. Again, a pier and beam company would be called out on this. Electrical wires, we talked about that. This electrical wire right here was actually live and in a moisture area. So I stayed on all dry, dry ground whenever I went underneath the house and uh, I made it out. I didn't see this until I was all the way in there, but I won't go under a house if I see a bunch of electrical wires. I won't go underneath the house if they're all on the ground. Um, I'll, I'll uh, basically just let them know, you know, they need to get them electrical wires up off the ground. Brian, you said um, the powder is, and then you stopped. Are you asking me what the powder is? That was from a while ago. Sorry, I'm just not seeing that.
Oh, okay. I see what you're doing. Okay. Did I, did I answer the question on that? The powder is? Okay, good. Thank you. Anyway, electrical wires, you need to watch out for that. Um, all electrical wires shouldn't be on the ground. If you go underneath the house and you see sewer pipes that are there and they're basically uh, on the ground, I write that up. They should be on straps. That way, if the house is settling, that pipe's going to move with the house. It isn't just going to be on the ground and it's sitting there and then the house is going to move and it'll cause problems in the connections of that pipe. Uh, I know we're not talking about HVAC units, but you're going to run into those inside of uh, crawl spaces. They should still have a drip pan and they should also have their secondary line going out of the house as well. Um, this one right here doesn't and, and it should. And then over here, let me move me this line going up here. That is actually a flex line and it shouldn't be going into the cabinet like that. They should have a rigid pipe coming out. Again, we're not talking about HVAC units, but since that was in there, you're going to run into these. And same thing with the with the water heater. If you got a water heater underneath the house, I would want it in a drip pan because you don't want moisture on the ground. You want that moisture to run out. And if it's in a drip pan, it's probably going to run out. The more moisture you have, the more insects you have, the more uh, rodents you're going to have. And if it's a lot of moisture, you're going to have piers that are going to sink down the ground. Cast iron pipe. Um, anytime I run into a house with cast iron pipe, I make a notation of it and I really look at it as well as I can. I'll go as far on this right here to take a screwdriver and dig underneath this pipe right here to see if there's any moisture. If you got a house that's built in 1960, 1970, it's got cast iron pipe. Um, I don't put this in my report because basically I'm not supposed to, but I do tell them that it would be best to have a plumber to come out and take a look at that to make sure that it's still functioning as it should be. Um, a lot of times I'll find where they've replaced a lot of stuff with PVC, but then you'll still have a cast iron pipe. This one right here is leaking at the connection. Um, you'll also see cast iron pipe and you'll see little uh, anoids coming off of it. It looks like slime that's dripping but it's it's it can be hard and what that is is that cast iron pipe dilapidates and moisture uh, slush is moving in between the dilapidation steel and it is uh basically it's what it's doing is is water is just coming through but it isn't big enough to really drip yet you probably stick a screwdriver in there and punch it i do make why would you, okay, here's the reason why. If you do a home inspection, somebody just asked, why would you not, notation of a cast iron, I do make a notation of the cast iron pipe in my report, regardless if it's good or not good. Does that answer your question, Steve? Okay, good. No, I definitely do, and you should too. I'm sorry if I said something different there. Uh, basically, you should uh, notate any cast iron pipe in Texas, we have to notate what type of pipe is in the house uh, from, doesn't matter what it is in, on the drain line and the supply pipe too. Um, again, I was talking a while ago, if a house is built in 1960, 70, that cast iron pipe is just about gone. But I, I can't put that in the report. You just can't. But I make a notation about it. And um, I may even tell the client, you know, I recommend any time a house uh, cast iron pipes inside of a house like that, I recommend that they have it cameraed and, and have it looked at. Again, we have this area. Uh-oh. Okay. Again, we have this area right here where you see the beam back here going straight across, but you have a pier going up against a floor joist. You don't want that. They should, if they're gonna reinforce this for some kind of reason, they should take a beam from one end to the other is what they should really do. Inside the crawl space, I've run into a lot of weird things. And the weirdest, I guess, I've run into that you wouldn't expect, in, expect is buzzards uh, inside the foundation crawl space. And man, you're talking about something stink. That was horrible. 
And those are baby buzzards too. What they were doing in there, I have no idea. They didn't bother me. I didn't bother them. And at first I wasn't sure what they were, but then the daddy or the mama came in and, and I'm glad I got out when that one came in. Spiders are gonna be all inside the foundation crawl space. So you need to be careful and watch out for them. A real quick story, I was doing a house. Matter of fact, I live the town that I was living in. I was doing the house as a pier and beam. I crawled in on my belly and I'm all the way inside. And so I'm looking up at the floor flashlight and I start seeing these little red, red dots, you know, and I, I don't know what they are. So I turned around about every four feet in between the floor joist up in between the floor joists and the subfloor were spiders. All of them were black whittles underneath that whole house. Um, so I got out of there as careful as I could and as quick as I could. And, uh, but be careful when you go inside of a house, always look everywhere before you actually crawl in, especially on each side of you. Um, I've seen snakes when I stick my head in there, they'd be right there. And you need to make sure that you just don't crawl all the way in and, and, and you scared and it's going to bite you. Anybody that knows me knows I don't, me and snakes are not, not friends. We will never be friends. This is a picture of snake that was underneath the house that I did. It's all the same snake. It's not three snakes. And then this right here, I did have a video, but I couldn't get it on here of a snake that I found inside of an electrical panel. And I videoed that, but it's not on here. Um, Next, we're going to talk about roofs. I'm going to shoot through here because I'm taking too long and I really do want to get to foam insulation. So I'm going to, if you have a question, I'll keep an eye on the chat part and you guys ask your question. I did it again, didn't I? There we go. All right. I want to talk about three types of, of roof coverings, fiberglass shingle metal roofs and terracotta roofs. Um, basically, the shingles, the common deficiencies that I see on, on fiberglass shingles is the felt paper not being put on right. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows how to put felt paper on a roof or not, but the sides, it should go under the drip edge and on the front, it should go over. Now, there's a lot of discussions and it's different and it's different, but that's the way that I do it. And most of the people in my area do it. Now in Florida, uh, their code is to go underneath the drip edge all the way around. And I'm sure it has something to do about hurricanes, but where I am, and this is the way that most people do it, it shouldn't go underneath the drip edge at the eave. It should go over the drip edge at the eave. And then the rake should uh, go under the rake. Again, it's going underneath the drip edge here. These are areas that you can look at. And when you first drive up to a house and you notice where the walls meet in the, the, the shingle is raise those shingles up a little bit. Don't tear no shingles or anything like that. But I try to raise up, put my hand under there because a lot of times you're gonna find rotten wood right there. Um, also by front porches where it's got a little wall like that, same thing. Also up here, the soffit will have damage to it. You have all this water coming down from this roof. On this other side over here, you don't necessarily have it. You know, that's just the regular um, slope going up a gable roof right there. But you do have a valley here. And you want to look at these places. Um, also around any of the flashing, especially the electrical mast, you want to look at that, see if you can see if it looks like it's uh, even got one uh, uh, flashing around it. A lot of times they'll just put caulking around them, but you'll find some wood rock there. And also just above the water meter, I mean the water meter, the uh, electrical meter, if you look up in there, you can kind of tell. Sill strips, you don't never want to undo sill strips on a roof to see if the nails are overdriven or see if the nails are in the right place. Once you undo that seal strip, it's never going to be the same again. They'll have to come back in there with some kind of sealant and seal it back down. Um, if you have a shingle that's loose, you can look at it and raise it up if that's what you want to do. But I tell all my guys, don't, don't mess with the seal strips. Don't pull up on the seal strips. What end up happening is you'll tear the shingle down here 
or you'll you'll rip the shingle as you're trying to raise up if there's something on there that you want to look at. On the ridge caps, you can look up there and you'll see that they're not sealed or maybe they're overdriven. These are overdriven nails. And what happened here is during during seasons, it this this material, the shingles will expand and contract, expand and contract, and that nail will probably not be holding that. Um, also, keep in mind too the way that the nails are nailed in. We'll get to that at the at the end of this. The nails should be nailed in to where they're here. I, you don't need to check this stuff. I'm just letting you know so you'll have the knowledge of this. The nails should be to where they're hitting the next shingle. In other words, each shingle has four nails in it, but it actually has eight because the shingle above it's going to hit it. The shingle above that's going to hit the one below that. And that's just the way that it goes. What we have right here is a dryer vent that's clogged up. Things you want to look for on a roof, dryer vents. Um, also, you can look. I call it the zipper effect. I don't know if anybody's ever seen or not. If you have, you can say, yes, I've seen it. It's to where the left tab of normally uh, a shingle, it goes up in a diagonal direction up to the roof. And every one of those tabs are loose going up to the roof. What happened is wind will catch up under that. And when wind catches up under that, it's going to rip them shingles off. So I do write that up. I kind of explain it that it's more or less in my terminology, it's a zipper effect. Um, depending on how many of those they have, a roofer can come out there at the, with a gun with some real good caulking or sealant and they can put them back down to where they're not gonna raise up. I don't tell them that, I just tell them they need a roofer to look at it. Again, each side of the fireplace is a good place to find rotten wood. Um, and where this valley comes down at, and you got a you got a, a water deflector there, also right in there behind that. Again, you don't want to pull the shingles up. They probably have a seal strip in the front of it, um, and and you don't want to mess with that either. But if you can get your hand in there to look at it to see if anything's rotten, uh, you can put it in the report. Chimneys. It's another item that you look at when you're on the roof, the one to the left, it doesn't have a chimney cap or spark arrestor. I also look at the, the actual bricks themselves and the mortar, finding cracks in their voids everywhere um, and over here too. Not necessarily that the cracks are gonna cause water to get in the house, but what will happen is, is water will go into those cracks in the winter time. And then what happens is the, the water will freeze and expand and then it's gonna cause spalling on those bricks. Um, and it's best if all the trailers sealed up properly. And this is what we usually run into. Um, I just had a message on there about something. Anyway, basically, whenever you have shingles like this, it's just granulars missing. I don't put down there's hail damage or storm damage, tree hit it. That's not none of my business. My business is letting the client know that they need somebody to look at this shingled roof. They need somebody to look at this shingled roof to make sure that it's, uh, that it will last them. Can everybody hear me okay? Somebody you, say you yes. Did, you did okay, that a good. second ago, but you're good. All right. Um, anyway, on these shingles, when the granulars are missing like that, I don't put down storm damage or anything like that. I just let them know that they need a roofer to come out there. And I think my narrative is something in the neighborhood of uh, there are a lot of granulars missing from this roof. With granulars missing, it's going to wear uneven. I recommend a roofer to come out for longevity of the roof. Well, that gives the roofer, I'm letting the client know that the roofer does need to come out and look at this because there are granulars missing. And he can tell them that, you know, it's going to last you one year, it's going to last you 10 years. I don't give any kind of estimation on how long a roof's gonna last. I just simply tell them, this is it, and you need to have a roofer to come out and take a look at it. I'm gonna just shoot through these pictures again. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Layers of shingles in Texas. Um, I, I, anyway, I let them know if they got more than one layer. 
And you got to be careful too in South Texas, especially in anywhere there's wood roofs or used to be wood roofs, you'll find where it still has a wood roof and they've nailed the shingles on top of the wood roof and use the wood shakes as, as deck board. And if the customer wants to replace that roof or has a problem with that roof and wants to replace it, it's going to cost them money because most roofer nowadays will not go in there and lay on top of a wood shake roof. Um, a lot of insurance companies, and I don't get into this, but will not insure a roof if it's got more than two or three roofs on it, depending on what area you're in, if this helps you or not with that. But anytime there's more than one layer, I always let everybody know. Gutters are another item that you want to look at. Um, ridge vents are another item. You'll find a lot of ridge vents that may be loose. Um, let's see. The roof on the house needs to be aerated inside the attic, which means it needs to have roof vents and soffit vents both. I believe that it's one square foot to every 150 foot if they have a vapor retard for, for moisture. And if it doesn't have that, then I believe it's one square foot to 300 square foot. And what they're talking about the 300 is the floor space inside the attic. And then the one square foot to every 300 square feet, that's talking about the square foot, the soffit and the roof. They really don't tell, differentiate between those two on, on how much you should have of the soffit or how much you should have of roof. But it looks like to me that the roof should have more than the air that's going in to where that air can be pulled a lot better. Um, so that's something to, to, to think about whenever you're looking at a roof. Metal roofs, and I'm gonna fly through this, basically screws. Look for the screws. Look for any caulking you see on a metal roof. Metal roof shouldn't have caulking on it. Um, there are very, in these areas anyway, there are very few incidences where a roof has caulking on it and the a metal roof has caulking on it. And also there are certain flashings that everything uses. Uh, these right here are bathroom vents. You can see they're just put on there. That's not the correct way to do that. Um, and I let my client know that they need somebody that deals with metal roofs to come out and take a look at this to do it properly. On these metal roofs, you'll get wind driven rain and most insurance policies do not cover wind driven rain. That's where there's no opening and the rain is, the wind's blowing and the rain just goes into crevices and it can ruin a house, a uh, uh, ceiling inside the house. And there's no insurance for that in a lot of instances. Used to, there was no insurance at all. And I think they've changed it a little bit, but most policies do not have that. So you wanna make sure you point this out and bring it up and, and just say, recommend a roofer to further evaluate where the seams are not going down completely and, and they're not flushed. Here goes another one. And things that, that you should look for on a roof and, and know that, that it's, this is going to kind of tell you what material is used on a roof. Now, not everything's on this one. You notice the, the ridge cap, the vent ridge up here um, is there. You, even though you have a metal roof, you still got to take and put um, bridge vents. It's got to have um, air in there. It's got to have air circulation. So you still need your vents on the roof and you still need your vents on the, uh, the roof and the soffits. And I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to fix it in a minute. Okay, I think I got it fixed. Um, so you want to make sure that there's plenty of ventilation inside of the house. Whenever you uh, look at the sewer vent pipes that go through, a lot of times somebody puts a, a metal roof on a house, they don't mess with the sewer vent pipes, they just leave them up inside the attic. And they're supposed to go all the way through the attic at least six inches past the roof space, I mean, past the roof line. Uh, keep in mind that they do have, I can't think of the name of them right now. Somebody knows what I'm fixing to say. You can write it on there. But basically it's a air gap to where air gets in, but it doesn't let air, air out. And so um, they're little plastic. You probably see them underneath sinks where the sink is in the center of the kitchen. And um, 
it's on top underneath and it's it's higher than the drain yes there you go um aav is what they're calling it air admittance valve thank you so much john i appreciate that man anyway you can have those inside the attic but remember wherever those are they need to be gotten to because those things do fail the way the flashing is here that's correct the way the the flashing is on the face here going up the rake is the way it should be. You should have drip edge and you should also have these little foam pieces in the rib area of the rib roof. That way you don't get insects, mostly wasps where I live. They'll go up in there and they'll make a nest big time. That should be in there. Um, move this over here. The first picture is just showing you the, the, the rake flashing that's there. All right, everybody look at the way that this, this neoprene boot is, how it's screwed in. That little part that the screw is going through is almost like lead and it bends and it bends with the ribs on the roof and it sits flush. And there might even be adhesive on the other side of that, if I'm thinking correctly. But that's the type that you should use. You shouldn't be using a lead jack or just a plain neoprene, ne, neoprene boot on there. It needs to be this type of boot for all metal roofs. Also, they make these big enough to go over flues as well. Um, I, I don't, as far as I know, once the air gets up to, to the area where this is, it isn't, the heat isn't going to bother is what I've been told. Um, but basically, this is the type of, of flashing that you need around any kind of stack that comes out of the metal roof it needs to be this type. Terracotta roofs, I'm going to fly through this. Basically, I want to make this easy. Go online. Um, I think you can even go, go to uh, InterNACHI's and you can find things about terracotta roofs, um, clay roofs, and cement roofs. They have a lot of these down south. And uh, the way they put them together is, is, is unique, but I don't never walk on these roofs. Uh, basically, I'm looking at it with the ladder or a second story window that I'm looking at, and I'm taking pictures of where cracks are, uh, chips are, and things like that. But you really don't want to walk on these roofs if you can keep from it. If you do walk on them, you need to know where you're walking and what you're doing. I'm not going to tell you I've never walked on them because I have. Um, but you, you really shouldn't. And it seems like when I, I inspect these type of roofs, I always run in to uh, wood rot on the fascia. I don't know why. I know this has got a gutter here, but even ones without a gutter. Uh, I don't know if it's because of the way the ends are and it's got a lower section in the middle and the water just runs down or what. One thing right here is I don't see any drip edge, but that drip edge is not going to help it down here. Foam insulation, this is where I wanted to be. All right, has everybody ran into foam insulation? You can just type. Yes, I have it in my own place. Good, man. Okay, good, I get it. All right, basically, I wanna play this video right here. You'll notice, He's only spraying like a half an inch of this and look how far out it comes. Okay, basically more and more foam insulation is, is coming around. Uh, when it first come out in my area around 2000, 2003 and four, 2003, basically, I would inspect the house that had it in there in 2000 and find a lot of stuff going on with it that wasn't right. When this first came out, they had the, um, the spray foam that was not porous. Now it's porous. You can actually pour a glass of water and it comes through. Before, what would happen is, and it's real hard. It's, it's not like, um, it's not soft the way that the foam is that should be used. It's it, the one that shouldn't be used on a roof is hard. What was happening was if you had a leak on the roof, you'd never know it. It would run down, hit the soffit, and run into the wall. You wouldn't know it until it's too late. There's a lot of damage. 
Um, and so they changed over from that type to the type that was porous and water can run through. All right. Um, this is a wall that's been done. It's a foam wall inside the house. This is another one. Um, basically, this is nothing here inside the walls of the house. These are, these are exterior walls. They don't put this at the, on the inside wall. Some people do if you got a lot of money, but um, most people don't. What they do though, um, here's the deal. With foam insulation, and we're talking about inside the attic now, with foam insulation, there cannot be any type of other insulation on the attic floor. Um, it causes mildew, moisture, condensation, whatever you want to call it, it'll cause problems. Closed cell, thank you. It'll cause problems. So all the insulation, if it's a retro and you run into this sometime where they put foam in there, all the insulation needs to be out of there. If they've got insulation on the floor too, then, then the house should be vented and that kind of defeats the purpose of the foam insulation. Um, another thing about it is you may run into some insulation inside the house. You may have a bedroom sitting there and on the other side of that bedroom is the attic space and they've got an HVAC unit there and they wanted to quieten down that HVAC unit so they'll use it as a, as a noise canceling. So you may see foam um, in, in between the studs, vertical insulation, something like that, that might be there, but it shouldn't have paper on it on either side. Attics need ventilation when not completed with foam insulation. This includes soffit vents and roof vents. What I'm talking about right here is garages, garage attics. Um, and I'm looking at the clock over here. I'll, I'm going to try to keep on the five o'clock, but it may not happen. Basically on garages, you'll run into, when you, when you have a foam sprayed home inside the main part of the attic above the house, the main house, and the garage doesn't have anything, you should have a wall between that garage attic and the house attic with a door that opens up with weather stripping, everything, just like it was a house on the other side of that. And usually it'll be spray foam and then you'll have the garage area. And a lot of times they won't put any type of ventilation inside that attic area. And they need to have soffit vents and they need to have a roof vent there. And you'll run into it to where they don't. And what will happen in this area is it'll build up condensation on the wood. And over years, it will end up causing wood rot is what will end up happening. Before I go on to the next slide, consider that a home with foam insulation is like a capsule, even a Tylenol capsule. No air in, no air out. Now, we all know that you can't make a house that air can't get in and out because there's going to be places. But for the most part, think of it that way. No air in, no air out. And there's ways that they get air in the house, and I'm not going to get into that. It has to go through the HVAC unit. Um, but there's just no air in, no air out. So you're breathing all the air in the attic, and inside the uh, attic, you're breathing all the air inside the house. So you're sharing air with the attic. So if you have a furnace area, I'm going to go ahead and skip this. I'm going to skip that. 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 I'm going to come back to it, but I'm going to skip it now. If you have a furnace inside the house, I'm going to go to this because it's kind of important. Okay. Naim, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Does it need ventilation when it does have all the insulation? No, it does not. And we're going to talk about that. It does not need ventilation. Remember, it's a whole capsule. When everything is a foam insulation, it does not need ventilation. There may be some fresh air coming into the HVAC unit, which I'm not going to get into. Um, you can look that up, probably go into InterNACHI, and they may have something about that. Uh, some houses require it and some don't. It depends on the size of the house. But to answer your question, no ventilation, no soffit vents or anything. If you, if you have a garage, and it doesn't have any kind of insulation and it's no foam insulation and it's blocked off from the main part of the house, that has to have, it has to have uh, air ventilation in it. 
you can't just block that off. That would be just like a regular house with no ventilation at all. I hope that answered your question. All right, let's talk about this really quick here. Um, HVAC units, and this is an easy way to think of this. If you have a house that has nothing but um, foam insulation, airtight, no air in, no air in, out, no air out, you can't have this type of HV heating unit, basically. This is a HVAC unit, but the furnace cannot be like this. It has a metal pipe. Think of a metal pipe on top of the HVAC unit that goes to the furnace. And then it goes out through. You can see it right here. It goes out through. You have to have at least a 90% energy efficiency type unit. And anytime you see those units, there's going to be, I'm just going to put it like this. There should be two PVC pipes on top of it. The PVC pipes go up and through the roof. They may go into one container, but one of those pipes are bringing air in from the outside and it's going right back out through the exhaust. That's why you have two intake exhaust. Okay. That way you're not using any kind of air inside that house because you can't, it's, it's your, it's livable space. Basically it's, it's, you wouldn't have a gas furnace like this right here inside of a bedroom, right? No, you wouldn't. So uh, you have to have that 90% energy efficiency in order to have it inside the attic area. Now, I would never tell anybody that they need to take their HVAC out of the attic and put in the one that's 90% because they can actually build a closet around this an actual closet around it that's sealed off from the attic interior of the attic. And they can have a exhaust fan to where the air is going out and an intake fan, or it can be uh, just, uh, just uh, gravity worked that way. And it can work that way, but they'll have to build a room around this and they'll have to build it all the way up to the roof where the, where the flu goes out. Any questions on that? Okay, this is an instance here to where they had a water heater flue that was coming up and this is a new build. And I explained to them, you can't, you can't do that. And so anyway, they ended up having to tear all this right here out. They went ahead and tore it out and they, they put in a, um, an energy, they put in a tankless water heater that, that had the PVC pipe. And I know I say PVC pipe, but I, I just want you to know that with the PVC pipe like that, it's, it's the way that's going to catch your eye. If you go into a attic and you see a water heater or a, a furnace that has metal coming up and everything else is foamed inside that attic and there's no ventilation inside that attic, then you know that something's wrong here and they need somebody to come out and check it out. You can have an HVAC guy to come out or a plumber should know. They should have, somebody, the foam people that put the foam inside the house should know. Somebody should know. I haven't ran into new homes like that, but I used to run into new homes all the time like that back in 08, uh, 07, 09, during that time, to where they would just put the regular um, furnaces and water heaters inside the attic area. That's not the end. We're going to go back because I still got two minutes. All right. I want to try to explain this the best way I can. I'm probably going to make a bird's nest out of it, all right? So just bear with me. This is an attic to where the house on the other side, um, there's no wall there. You see this wall? Picture if there was a door that opened and closed right there, all right? But then also picture that that foam and that wall did not exist. And you have this above the garage. You can't do that. Two things need to happen. Either you make a wall and notice they foam the roof too. They foamed the roof, but they didn't do anything. They just foamed the roof. And this is above the garage, okay? Two things need to happen here. Either they build a wall right here, and they make a door or whatever to where you can get in. And they have vents in there. Even though it's got a foam insulation on the roof, they still have to have um, they still have to have ventilation in this part of the room, in this part of the house. Okay. There's no conditioned air inside of a garage. The garage has fumes in it and everything else. 
And that's why they would have to have a wall up here and vents inside the garage would be so that moisture can't build up on the wood that you see there because it's not sharing the air from inside the house. It's got its own just regular outside air that it's sharing and you're gonna have a temperature difference and it's gonna cause moisture, okay? This area right here is going up some stairs in, above a garage. There's no doors or anything going on. It's just going up into a foam place. This house is lived in and, and the builder built it like this. When you go up these stairs, there needs to be a door or something to block this off from the garage. You can't just have it open like that and then go up into the attic area and the house area. It needs to be closed off from the house area, the area that has the conditioned air. Any questions there? If you have an attic area that has spray foam everywhere inside the whole attic, including the garage and everything is done the way it should be done, and we'll see that in a minute, this, this access hatch doesn't, is not, cannot be inside the garage. It needs to be inside the house somewhere. Not necessarily this, but they need to have an access hatch inside the house, not in the garage. Again, you're never gonna be able to seal this up properly, keep fumes out. So that access hatch would need to be sealed up, foamed over, and you'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. And then the access hatch would be inside the house somewhere. This is a garage that has the foam insulation on the attic flooring and the foam insulation on the roof. And now then it doesn't have to have a partition between the house and the garage because it's sealed off all the air and now then it's sharing the air inside the garage. I mean, inside the main part of the house. All that air is being shared together and it's okay because the foam's gonna knock off and, and keep everything the same temperature, all right? Blues that come up, this right here is a fireplace. It can't be open like that. You gotta have that closed off. What they'll usually do is put a heat shield here and a heat shield is just goes around this right here. It's bigger than this, about three inches. It'll be messing that by about three inches. Then they'll spray foam it up to that heat shield. And it's okay for the heat shield to have contact with that spray foam. They say that there's some foam too that they can use that is an orange color that is totally fire retard. This stuff right here, this foam is supposed to be fire retard too. But the orange color, if you ever see that, from my understanding, that is, that is totally fire retard. Okay. And I guess that's it. There's a lot more to learn about this foam. This wasn't even, I should have started out with that probably. Um, but I appreciate everyone coming and listening to this. Does anybody have any questions? Guy, I'm not sure. Uh, Steven, I'm not sure if they have it or not. Um, I looked and I didn't see anything, but I'm not the greatest person in the world to go to Internet and try to find stuff because there's so much stuff there. It, it's just, it blows my mind how much stuff is there on, on InterNACHI's website. You have everything at your fingertip. If they don't have anything about foam, um, they should. Let me give you this too, if anybody's still around. Um, you can go to um, ask me at camelothomeinspections.com. Send me an email if you got a question about this, or if you have another question, I don't mind. Um, just send me an email, ask me at camelothomeinspections.com. The inspections is plural. As you can see up here, it's plural. You can go there and then uh, email me if you got any questions. If you got any questions about spray foam, if I don't have the answer, I'll find it for you. I don't mind. All right, guys, any other questions about anything else, the roof or anything? I guess not. Well, I really appreciate y'all coming out. I really do. This is my first webinar. I've done training videos before, but I haven't done a webinar. Um, hope I was informative for you guys. So uh, everybody have a Merry Christmas. 
and a happy new year. Be safe out there. If you're up north, watch out for them slippery roofs, man. And y'all have a good one. <laughs>